It's a film that bears one of cinema's most shocking and disturbing scenes ever. Now, if you've seen Deliverance, then you probably know which scene I'm talking about. It's not because the scene is necessarily bloody or gory or even explicitly violent, but it is so effective and visceral because it simply and powerfully conveys just how vulnerable we can be when we step outside of the so-called safety nets that we think society provides for us. Now, since this is predominantly a horror channel, when I was outlining this episode, what I initially wanted to talk about was how I believed that this 1972 classic was indeed the forerunner and maybe even the cinematic influence behind films like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes, and more recently, Wrong Turn. But I realized that after watching it for the third time in a single week, that comparing Deliverance to anything else would simply be diminishing its relevance, its importance, and also its powerful message. Now, it's not to say that those other films aren't brilliant in their own right, or that there aren't any comparable aspects or links between Deliverance and the films that I just mentioned. There certainly are. All of these films have similar markets. A group of city slickers taking what starts out to be a fun trip into the dense backwaters of the deep south, only to get tangled up with an unsavory group of mountain people with seriously bad teeth. Their backyards that look more like rusty junkyards, hell there's even the old forsaken gas stations. But the truth is, regardless of the influence, even now some 50 years since its release, Deliverance, like its title suggests, has been set free and it's transcended any categorization. So instead of comparing Deliverance to anything else, what I'd like to do today is something a little bit different. It's going to be a, a bit of a longer episode, so if you like the longer content, then please let me know. I'm going to be analyzing Deliverance, kind of giving you my in-depth opinion about what makes this film so exceptional, so unique, and also so groundbreaking. And by the way, if you haven't seen Deliverance yet, then maybe stop watching this episode and go check the film out because there are going to be spoilers. If you have seen it, then feel free to give me your own analysis. Tell me what, what you thought of the film. Did you, did you like it? Did you not like it? And tell me what you think about this episode. I'm always up for a good banter, as you know. On that note, welcome to Den of Horror. And I truly hope that you enjoy this episode. Now, like I mentioned, Deliverance was made in 1972. So outside of the more technical aspects, there really is something different about the great films from the 1970s. Now, trust me, I'm not one of those that don't make movies like they used to types. This isn't a rant. I'm not going to stand here and unfavorably compare modern day movies to the movies of yesteryear. But I do think that the movies from the 1970s, the thing that made them so different is that the filmmakers who produced their seminal work in that era were more concerned with the narrative's deeper themes and messages, more so than they were with, with plotting and story structure. It's kind of like they said what they felt needed to be said and simply did not compromise on that. Maybe you disagree, I don't know. Again, I'm not trying to suggest that you don't get deep and introspective films today, you certainly do. I'm also not suggesting that the movies out of the 70s, like Taxi Driver and The Deer Hunter and of course Deliverance, that they in some way had sloppy plot structures. They certainly didn't. Now, I didn't live through the 1970s, but from what I've read and seen, it was a decade where some kind of a global awakening took place. Artistic expression was not only praised, but it was actually expected by the audience. They were risky films for a risky time. People wanted to see films that not only entertained them, but also shook them up a little bit, invigorated them, represented them truly. People wanted to see films that also spoke about some of the dark realities in and around their society. Now, excuse me for getting all deep on you, but in my opinion, the great films from the 1970s were more like brave motion picture poems than they were entertaining stories. They weren't afraid to come out swinging and therefore packed quite an emotional punch. They were heavier, they were grittier, and they were dangerous. And it's all of this combined that I believe makes Deliverance such a different film. It's often been said that when director John Borman turned James Dickey's novel of the same name into a film, the theme he was most concerned with was the theme of survival. Now that's very apparent and it's also suggested in the title itself, but what jumped out to me while I was watching this film, and it's the theme that I'd like to discuss with you today, is the one of adversary. 
Throughout the film, the theme of adversary takes shape in many different forms. When our four city slickers arrive in the deep south seeking out the fictional Kahula Wasi River for a canoeing weekend away from the bustle of the city, well this is where I started to see the theme of adversary really starting to take shape. First there's nature versus urbanization, as is seen in the opening scene where bulldozers are digging chunks of earth out further and further into the wilderness. There's also man versus nature, we see this with our boys battling the rough rapids of the river. Also, novice city slickers versus violent toothless mountain men, that's a pretty obvious one, which is set up early on too. But there's also manhood versus timidity, which is obviously quite a hot topic today. Now, in my opinion, our four main characters represent the four archetypes of the male psyche. First, we have John Voigt, who plays the character of Ed, a level-headed guy who loves his life and in a way has become complacent in the comforts of city life. There's Ned Beatty, who brilliantly plays Bobby, the victim of the previously mentioned infamous scene. He's a chubby, happy-go-lucky guy, completely out of place with his soft frame and physically ill-prepared for the wild. It's also Ronnie Cox of Robocop fame as Drew, the guitar-playing, sensitive dude with a conscience. And lastly, there's Burt Reynolds' character, Lewis Medlock, the personification of tough, rugged, and stubborn madness. Adversary and survival will profoundly change these characters by the time the end credits roll. Of course, the adversary that has the most profound effect on a person's life is the one that challenges them not only physically, but mentally, psychologically, and emotionally too. In one particular scene when Ed draws back his arrow in order to kill a deer, but begins trembling mid-action at the thought of killing another creature, another adversarial theme begins to emerge, and that is man's battle versus his conscience. So bearing that in mind, I began wondering if Deliverance's most complex form of adversary was man's battle versus himself. One element that John Borman truly excels at is the element of foreshadowing. Like a true masterful storyteller, he plants the seeds of the horror that our four city slickers are about to endure early on. At first, there's Bobby's initial mocking, almost patronizing attitude towards these primitive mountain men. Another is when Griner, a particularly toothless character, asks Lewis why he and his buddies are looking for the river in the first place, to which Lewis replies, because it's there. Griner then warns, it's there all right. You get in and then you can't get out. Earlier on, I mentioned Deliverance's very infamous scene, but the film also boasts another scene that is very famous, albeit for a different reason. When Drew pulls out his guitar and starts strumming a tune called The Dueling Banjos with a young boy, the scene starts out as quite touching. Drew plays a ditty and the boy, who has all the symptoms of a future likely filled with bad teeth, plays along slowly. Before long, City Slicker and Mountain Boy are furiously racing up and down their instruments in unison. Towards the end of this duet, Drew, struggling to keep up with this little boy's frantic, almost savant-like pace, cries out, I'm lost! Another piece of foreshadowing? You bet. When Drew, trembling and totally taken by the exchange, darts over to the boy to shake his hand, God damn boy, you play a mean banjo! Except, the boy emotionally ignores him. No, this was not a duet. This was a duel. This was us versus you. This was adversary. And in my opinion, it was also something else. It was another piece of foreshadowing. Nothing here is what it seems. In Deliverance, the point of no return takes place on the river, and I'll explain why I think that that is pretty significant a little bit later on. But the boys are in their two canoes, are drifting down the river, and they pass underneath a bridge. And who is perched on top of the bridge like a mythical bird of prey? None other than our little banjo boy. Drew, still taken with the previous duet, if that's what you want to call it, weighs up at the little boy, to which the little boy responds with nothing but an emotionless stare. It's not only a powerful piece of story reincorporation, but it also holds a lot of gravity because it takes place on the river which in some mythology signifies change and also represents man's subconscious journey into the unknown. The now infamous squeal like a pig scene is the exact moments when deliverance begins 
delivering on its dark promise. Here is where we notice a shift in the film, and it's one that is hard to digest. Deliverance's shocking rape scene begins when Ed and Bobby encounter a pair of mountain men in the woods, one armed with a shotgun. After an argument, Bobby, our chubby, happy-go-lucky guy, is forced to undress, after which one of the men sodomizes him, demanding he squeal like a pig. Ed is bound to a tree held at gunpoint and is forced to watch the entire ordeal. Just as Ed is about to be raped, Lewis sneaks up and kills the rapist with a bow and arrow. The armed man makes a run for it, leaving the body of his partner behind. For me, the scene is as profound as it is shocking because it asks us, the audience, some very uncomfortable questions. What would we do in this situation? Would we fight back if we could? Would we take revenge or would we turn to society and its laws to serve justice? It's these very questions that the characters ask themselves and each other. Lewis wants to dispose of the body and forget about it. Drew wants to turn to the police. Ed is kind of sitting on the fence and Bobby is still in shock. It's also a potent scene because we know that from this point on, these characters will undergo a very difficult transformation, each in their own way and not necessarily for the better. Bert Reynolds later recalled that he got so uncomfortable filming this scene that he actually interrupted the shoot, ran up to John Borman and asked why he let it go on for so long, to which the director replied, I wanted to take it as far as I could with the audience and I figured that you'd run in if it got too far. As the film moves toward the end of its second act, and with the body disposed of, the men decide to get back home as quickly as possible, but of course, the wilderness is not done with it. As they travel via the river further and deeper into the wild, our happy musician Drew is presumably shot by the escaped mountain man from the cliffs above and topples into the raging rapids. Panicked and shocked, the three remaining friends plunge into the most savage part of the rapids and are thrown from their boats. Having lost their friend, the three swim back to the banks. Bobby is gripped by the fear of being hunted down. Ed desperately tries to find any sign of their fallen friend. And Lewis, the risk seeker, is practically unable to move after suffering a gruesome leg injury. The men need help and fast. But with someone trying to kill them now, one of the men is forced to find their potential killer before he finds them. The task falls on Ed, the man who earlier was unable to kill a deer for food or put up a fight against the two mountain men. Although an ensemble piece, Deliverance focuses mainly on the character of Ed, compellingly played by John Voight, hot of the success of Midnight Cowboy, and he gives an equally nuanced performance in Deliverance. One of the most powerful scenes in this movie is when Ed risks his life to climb to the top of the cliff and find the man he believes is trying to kill them. When he does find a man armed with a rifle and peering over the edge, obviously looking for the men in the river, once again, Ed raises his bow and arrow. Only the transformation from harmless city slicker to cold-blooded killer is not a simple one. Bolt aimed, Ed begins trembling at the idea of having to kill. When his assailant does turn, Ed almost clumsily lets go of the bolt and injures himself in the process, but he does manage to kill the man, sinking into the dark blue depths of the river, bloody, weak, and with climbing ropes floating in the water like umbilical cords. Ed is reborn. Maybe not an outright killer, but a man who has now faced his own primal brutality. It's evident that the film suggests that brutality and violence is within all of us. It just depends on the context. Now, outside of its thematic significance, the scene displays yet again just how rich and poignant deliverance can be. And it takes nothing for granted. As the film draws to its close, I started to wonder about the title again, Deliverance, the act of being set free, of being rescued. Drew's body is found and his friends have a makeshift ceremony for him, weighing him down and lowering him into the depths of the water. Here's where I started to wonder about the title again. Is Deliverance meant ironically in this case? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe Drew has been set free. Maybe all the characters have. Like I mentioned earlier, all of the characters in Deliverance undergo a profound transformation. Is Drew's the most profound of them all? He learns that the rules that govern his society are of absolutely no use in this one, but there is something more. In the beginning, he 
almost naively wanted to connect to something different. Now, he will forever be connected to the world in which he lost his life. Lewis, from being stubborn, reckless and quick on the draw, learns that life is no game. As physically the toughest one in the group, his strength has deserted him and he is harmless. Now as he goes from saviour to victim, having to rely purely on his friends. Bobby's transformation is also a potent one and I had to think about it for a while but in the end, it's him that cares for Lewis and in his own way, he has to rise from the role of victim to saviour. For Ed, the word deliverance takes on a particularly heavy notion. He is no longer a naive city slicker who was once happy to sit back and enjoy the comforts and indulgences of society. No. Now he is a saviour, but he is a killer too. One also gets the feeling that the experiences will haunt him for the rest of his life. Has Ed been delivered? Have any of these characters? Now I'm not sure how controversial deliverance is by today's standards, but I don't think that that's what's important about this film. For me, at least what I took away from it is that deliverance has a certain resonance in the way that it asks its questions and the way that it delivers its message. As you can see, I really love this film and I can certainly see myself watching it again, but what did you think of deliverance? What were your personal takeaways from this film? Let me know down in the comments and also in the comments if there's any other classics that you would like me to watch and share my thoughts on. Let me know. On that note, stay safe, stay happy, but most of all, be delivered.